there are a lot of uh, technology and societal trends and other things that are all coming together. And Karin, one of the things that we talked about earlier was this intersection between policy and technology. And sometimes technology drives policy, uh, like let's say Uber, and sometimes you have uh, policy driving technology where you get subsidies and mandates and things like that that help things happen faster. So could you just tell us a little bit about some of your work and, and how you see those coming together in urban mobility? One of the things I've been looking into is pricing, different kinds of pricing mechanisms and how they can be used, like, you know, congestion charging. And that's actually also an area where we had the theory first for a very long time, and then technology came along and helped us really starting to introduce it. And I think that this sort of link between technology and policy, as you said, will always be there. But we have to understand that in the mobility area in particular, whatever we do, there are what economists call externalities, so that we bring benefits or disbenefits to others. Mm -hmm. And that's why it isn't like any other good. Mm -hmm. That's why we'll always have to be incentivized or regulated in some way. So if technology is moving fast, policy also has to move fast. Mm -hmm. So that's going to start happening, policy moving fast? Yeah, okay, uh, good. that should yeah. start. Okay. <laughs> it's about to start, I would say. Okay, good. Uh, and so, uh, Pierre Francois, you've seen with, uh, with BCG, you've done some city studies. We talked about your work in Boston in particular. Yep. So, can you tell us a little bit about how you've seen policy and technology and then society come together in some of that work? Yeah, I think, in my opinion, you have two things when you speak about technology and regulation. First thing is how to make regulation um, speed up the time to market of those technologies because we speak a lot about autonomous vehicles, about electric mobility and, and so on. But if we do not change some stuff in our regulation, it won't happen. Mm -hmm. uh, say, for instance, traffic regulations need to adapt to, uh, to autonomous vehicles. And we need also some place in the city to test our vehicles. And that's why uh, BCG uh, has been doing uh, with the World Economic Forum in, uh, in, uh, in the city of Boston in Boston. Mm -hmm. And we have been doing some studies also in the Paris region at the moment. Um, so we need regulation to make it a reality, and then we need regulation to make uh, the technology deliver the benefits. Mm -hmm. Because if we say uh, autonomous vehicle will help uh, decongest our cities, will reduce traffic um, uh, jams and uh, car accidents, I mean, it won't happen naturally. So we need smart regulation to, not to, to speed up the time to market, but also to make it um, possible for the technology to deliver benefits both for the end users, so for you, me, but also the disabled, older person, and so on, and for the territories in terms of economy, in terms of uh, um, sustainability, environment, and, and, and so on. Mm. So one of the things I think it's really notable about autonomous vehicles, even connected cars, just uh, infor informatics, um, was that they would have never happened, uh, even if you not only left it to policy, but even just to big car makers. So, you know, autonomous vehicles sort of jumped into everyone's awareness because Google just started driving them around without telling anybody, right? They didn't really wait for anybody to catch up with them. So, Nico, with, uh, with your work, um, as a small company, do you feel like, one, you can influence regulation, uh, or just doing what you do and then let regulators catch up with you? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> this is a scary topic for us. I mean, politics and what's going to happen. I mean, we're betting a business on, on future regulation that it will be possible to have self-driving cars on the road at the moment. And, and from that perspective, it is obviously unknown. Mm -hmm. But the situation today is, is really good. So we are having cars out there driving on streets in Europe, in, in several countries uh, here in Europe and also in the US at the moment and planning to start driving in Japan. That is maybe the most unclear situation, what mm -hmm. to do there for the time being. But, but uh, the regulation and, and what has happened in, in the recent year, again, a lot of progress and from a positive perspective, good mm -hmm. spin. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's now allowed actually to test on roads, which, which is super, super great. Okay, can I put you on the spot and say which European country is doing this best now? Well, obviously, I'm from Finland, so I have to pitch a little bit. The, yeah. uh, the Finnish authorities, okay. they had a loophole. They decided not to patch it. And mm -hmm. uh, at the moment, you can test autonomous cars in Finland even without a safety driver inside the car legally. Oh. There needs to be a safety driver, but you can monitor it remotely. And I think that's pretty unique still. Okay, great. And so, Vince, we've heard a lot of the, you know, the work that you're doing. Does it... Does it any policy stuff uh, impinge on you? I mean, with a small car, you're thinking maybe safety or the other things that help or hurt? 
Yeah, I think for our project, we're mostly the integrators of others uh, opening up uh, this market. So mm -hmm. we piggyback kind of on the efforts of uh, companies like yours. But mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so kind of pivoting then from the sort of the, the policy question, um, which is always important, but not always the most fascinating, you know, aspect of uh, of any space. Um, wh what are the things? You know, I, I'm just struck by the two presentations that you guys did. How much of what was really crazy thinking three or four years ago is now kind of standard fare: local manufacturing, you know, uh, fleet ownership, you know, and things like that. So, what do you think three years from now we're going to be going? Wow, how did that? How did that happen so fast? And everybody, just pitch in. Perfect. Oh, yeah. You go. Um, yeah, I think the the biggest shift is just getting to a point where, um, yeah you don't think about mobility anymore. It becomes so ubiquitous or abundant that um, yeah, uh, everything uh, is within reach. And I, I think that's a start. I think another thing is that uh, most cities are now built around very fixed infrastructure for roads, for electricity, for water, and all these things. And that once we start getting to this point of having this constantly floating dynamic uh, grid of vehicles or mm -hmm. drones or whatever it's going to be, uh, it's going to create a big shift in, uh, yeah, in how we map out a city or how we design cities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And also, I mean, three years is out there from now. That's, that's a pretty long time. So, I mean, two years ago, we were not dreaming the stuff that's happening today. Yeah. And if you think about it, I mean, vehicle engineering, automotive engineering wasn't that sexy a few years back. It, it, it wasn't the industry to be in. Mm -hmm. Suddenly it is, and it's, of course, attracting now quite a lot of talent. And, and there is now mm -hmm. pool of, of, of new talent, which is going to speed up the development even further. Yeah. I think that one of the things is that we've been having this very strict line between what we call public transport or transit and what we call private transport mm -hmm. or uh, private owned, privately owned cars. And I think that that border is sort of softening up and I think that perhaps in, in three or five years time it will not be so easy for me as a transport researcher to tell what is public transport and what is private and that I think is quite fascinating development. Yeah, and so tying those two things together, you know, what you were talking about, this mobility becomes more like just flow, it's always present, and, and some of the things that we talked about there with the public-private uh, line blurring, the, a lot of the people assume, a lot of people assume that there will be more energy efficiency, less congestion, because we'll basically have these, you know, cars that can go drive themselves and park themselves someplace else. But then there's the sort of the flip side, that it could sort of be like social media, where we're completely inundated, you know, we just move around all the time, more than we used to, uh, because it's so easy. You know, same way we, we send a lot more messages every day because we have Twitter and Facebook and everything than we did when we needed to sit down and write a letter and put it in the, in the mail. So, you know, do we become just constantly moving all the time? Is uh, a conference like this basically a parking lot? What happens? Yeah. Well, I think that if um, travel becomes easier, travel will increase, basically. I think that's almost like a natural law. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, how much it will increase, that is, depends on, again, the mm -hmm. policies and conditions that surround it. But that travel is not just a fixed amount. It is the balance between how much effort we have to put into travel and how much benefit we can gain. Mm -hmm. And if we reduce the effort, then we will travel more. Yeah. So yeah. And I think also the whole perception about travel, now it's, uh, how do you say it, uh, from a cognitive perspective, it's something you need to think about, mm -hmm. it's not something you do wasteful, so to say, mm -hmm. uh, but once it becomes uh, wasteful that uh, travel is something you do maybe 20 times a day because it's always at your disposal, um, I think we're also going to interpret the time that you spend in these vehicles not anymore as uh, wasted time mm -hmm. uh, and so on, and we're going to interpret it as a continuous flow of our day maybe. Mm. Okay. Yeah, also, I'm, I'm really looking forward for autonomous travel, actually, because yeah. it's something we haven't experienced so far. I mean, we do, we can sit in a bus, but we still need to figure out when to step out. This time, you, you jump into an autonomous vehicle, whatever it is, and, and uh, it informs you when to jump out. So you can exactly. really, really focus on something else than, than the travel part. Yeah, and I, I think it's too early to say people will spend more time traveling, moving in the cities. When you look at the figures, uh, I mean, the, the, the time people spend moving in our cities didn't change mm -hmm. for years. Mm. Yeah. At the time. It, yeah. The time, but the distance. Yeah, the distance yeah. change because uh, we move faster. Mm -hmm. But the time, it's a fixed number. Um, yeah. Some people say the smartphone already changed something uh, in, in the public transportation because, I mean, mm -hmm. you don't care spending one hour if you can do something with your smartphone in a, mm -hmm. in a metro. 
but autonomous will be a, a big um, game changer, and mm -hmm. I think if, no one knows what could be the, the impact. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we use smartphones as a, an analogy for a lot of things because we've all, basically, most of us, if you're an adult, you've been through that change. You remember before and after smartphones and all the things they did. Um, and that change, you know, so smartphones, uh, iPhone was 2008, so roughly 10 years ago. And, you know, it, it's not like the change just got done happening now. Uh, so what do you see the timeline of the next, you know, eight or 10 years uh, in terms of between, you know, car sharing, autonomy, maybe other things like Hyperloops, or we've got some flying cars presenting here today. What are what are some of the big milestones that you see coming up? Uh, yeah, I think uh, also we're going to see a shift in the interface of how we interact with these uh, vehicles. Like right now, you still need to order something on your phone, and maybe you're busy staring at your phone. Uh, but maybe in the um, in the near future, uh, it's an opportunity to to use your surrounding and with AR uh, that when you drive, you get all kinds of information about what's happening in the city in a way more dynamic way than maybe now with a with a Facebook wall or uh, all kinds of other social media. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm actually looking really forward towards flying transportation. I mean, I, I'm into, obviously, I'm into flying as as, as yeah. a pilot, uh, but it's interesting to think about. So actually controlling an automated drone mm -hmm. is much easier than controlling an automated car. Mm -hmm. Every object is basically something to avoid, whereas in cars you have to interact with these objects. Mm -hmm. So the flying part is much easier to pull off, and, and therefore we might actually see flying automated drones before we can see automated cars out there. Are we going to be in those drones? Like Lilium is one of the companies here uh, presenting, right? Are we going to see that before we see um, self-driving cars? Also, Airbus, uh, they're here. They have a Vahana project. Yeah? OK. You heard it here. You get flying cars before you get self-driving cars. Excellent. <laughs> Good. Um, well, like I said, there's so much that we can, we can dive into here. Um, what are some of the things that we should be worried about? I mean, it's easy to be optimistic about the future, but like we talked about, maybe we'll be more congestion. You know, maybe there will be people hacking self-driving cars and crashing them into one another. What are some of the, the big worries that you have? Well, energy, energy and, and climate issues, of course, would be, I mean, uh, we have to make uh, travel more, more energy efficient and we have to make energy more carbon efficient. Otherwise, we're not going to be on this planet anymore. Mm. Okay. Yeah. I think in the coming years, we'll see big differences between cities that can adapt quickly to those technologies mm -hmm. and benefit from, uh, from them and the others that don't do anything and, uh, and at the end come up with a, a, a worse situation than, uh, than that we have today. So cities must make something today and adapt quickly because mm -hmm. in three or five or ten years the differences may be very important. Yeah. Do you think there are cities, uh, I'm just thinking about things like urban density or uh, you know, the uh, sort of distribution of where people live versus where they work, or things like that. Are there factors that you've seen with the uh, BCG work that affect which cities are more amenable to any of these technologies? Yeah, I think you cannot uh, compare uh, cities in the US from cities in Europe, mm -hmm. uh, for instance, just because uh, cars uh, are not, uh, I mean, as important in, in Europe as in the, in the US. And in Europe, we have uh, good public transportation. We have, uh, say, in Paris, we have uh, like the RER, the metro, and, and so on. So you have different cities. You have cities that are easy to adapt to those technology. Maybe in the US, it's, more, it's easier to, to adapt to, uh, to autonomous vehicles than in, uh, in Europe, because in Europe we need to organize the complementarity between uh, autonomous vehicles and public transportation. Mm -hmm. So, and then you have uh, cities in Asia or new cities in Africa that can directly jump to those new technologies. So I think you have kind of three types of cities, car cities, traditional European cities, and the new cities mm -hmm. that can directly make a, a big jump. Um, in the, in the coming years. Yeah. yeah, this is definitely something I'm also kind of uh, really anticipating. So suddenly we, we have here, are hearing talks about no, no diesel in cities anymore. Mm -hmm. Pretty fast happening, that, that, that start of the discussion. And we might actually see fairly fast the same discussion. Are people allowed to drive in cities anymore? Mm -hmm. Because it's so much easier and so much safer if there are no people driving between mm -hmm. robot cars. Okay, so it's so, like the opposite of the Turing test. You have to yeah, prove you're not yeah, a human yeah. to drive. And, okay. and again, I mean, we might come across that discussion okay. again fairly fast. Mm -hmm. okay. 
Uh, also think from a security and a threat perspective, um, the whole <coughs> mindset of, of making things open source and transparent and, and decentralized, like this blockchain mindset, is, uh, is a very important one. Mm -hmm. uh, so that everything is auditable by everyone instead of uh, controlled by one uh, organization. Mm -hmm. uh, and it also the point of attack for this infrastructure is not just with one company, but it's something that's really compartmentalized in, uh, uh, yeah, in a mm -hmm. decentralized way. So I think that model is very important to, uh, to keep as a base layer for the future. Yeah. yeah. So uh, if there's a, a, a glaring omission on this panel, it's that we don't have a car maker. Well, you guys are car makers, but we don't have uh, one of the big traditional car makers here. And you know, I know from our own work, every single car maker, the top priority is how do they deal with autonomy? You know, because it is this, uh, it's not just a change in the technology that's brought in a lot of new competitors like you guys. We haven't had new entrants in the automotive industry for decades. Uh, but it's also the change to the business model. Yep. And so, you know, what do you see? I mean, do you see them essentially being like, say, mainframe computers in the 80s versus PCs? Or uh, is this something that, you know, they're actually going to retain the, the position that they've got and, you know, they'll buy you up or, or they're going to basically consolidate this industry? What do you see happening? Okay. Well, I mean, I've been very positively surprised by car makers. Uh, they, are, they are very curious, obviously, for, for very specific reasons. They have to be curious, but, but they are also really positive and and I see, based on discussions that we've been having, they, they are very willing to change their way of working. They are willing to change the company and, and what they're doing as a business. So for me, I mean, it's, it's actually a pretty positive sign. And, uh, and I wouldn't play off any of the car makers. Mm -hmm. I think, I do believe that, that they will do a pretty strong comeback in this field. Mm -hmm. Vince, any? Uh, yeah. You're, you're more going straight off after yeah, them, exactly, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So. Um, yeah. I strongly believe we, uh, yeah, f for a big car manufacturer, of course, the whole focus is on producing as many vehicles as possible. Mm -hmm. So once this incentive starts changing because all these assets get shared by everyone and so on, it's, it's going to be a big challenge to, uh, yeah, to maintain their, their current way of operation. So mm -hmm. um, uh, I think they're very much needed for the transition, mm -hmm. uh, but I doubt if they can sustain uh, yeah, their current business model. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you think, again, looking at some historical comparisons, when there's been, been a big shift, you, you basically lose, say, all but one of the, yeah. the previous manufacturers? Again, let's say IBM survived yeah. the, the um, PC revolution. But yeah. so do you see, do we need as many car makers as we have? Are they going to be as big as they are? Or are they going to all just get a huge haircut? <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know. But uh, another example that I need to think about was um, uh, I thought it was Porsche, uh, who mm -hmm. are now basically um, uh, standardizing all the hardware that they deliver. So mm -hmm. they're uh, going to let go of uh, the fact that they uh, have different engines, different uh, things. Mm -hmm. And then they're going to shift towards this business model where uh, you just activate for a couple of hours that your engine has more power and it unlocks uh, with software. So and, and that's, for me, it's a very interesting shift because uh, once these platforms become open and the hardware is just a standardized thing and it doesn't matter anymore from which manufacturer or which brand it is, but it's all about the software, then I doubt if a hardware-centric company uh, uh, is the driver of that change or if mm -hmm. it's people uh, from the community that start tapping into this, uh, these APIs and uh, software opportunities. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you will get like many apps or uh, many upgrades that you just have for a couple of hours uh, on the same hardware mm -hmm. and then you let, let it go again. Yeah. Right, yeah. okay. It's kind of like the Volkswagen Beetle was sort of everybody's car in a lot yeah. of ways. Yeah. And it was uh, yeah. aftermarket and things like that. Yeah. Well, um, so we're at this, uh, this event, which is, a, an, again, an amazing um, confluence of uh, uh, industries and technologies and people and thinkers. So you know, what do you need? If you were to you know, turn to the people that are in the audience here and that are around the conference, what would you hope that they'll come and find you and say, hey, I've got this that can help you out or uh, that's something that you can offer them? For me to start? Yeah, go. <laughs> Yeah, I already said it in the presentation. I think uh, for us, uh, yeah, support also from the city of Paris would, of course, uh, be a great step. Mm -hmm. um, another thing is uh, like really this embedding in, uh, in the local community, so uh, uh, social working places, uh, schools that uh, focus on uh, car manufacturing and these kind of technologies. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm very happy to get in touch. Um, yeah, so that's my, uh, my quick call to action. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, talent. Obviously, talent. I mean, quite a lot of stuff still to do. So, mm -hmm. talent is, is, is would be great to get okay. from this conference. Good. 
Yeah, I think from, from cities, we need uh, them to, to anticipate a bit more than what they are doing today. Mm -hmm. And for, from technology providers, I think what they should do is to keep in mind the underlying objectives be, be, uh, beyond the technology and to think about the end user, uh, not to uh, make a car that is too complicated and look like a, a, a plain cockpit, for, for instance, but something really simple that can be used by a population that is getting older and older with a lot of disabled people that need to, to, to move and to travel in our, in our cities. And also the underlying objectives of our territories. So we need solution to, we need collaborative system for autonomous vehicles to interact, for, for instance, uh, in, uh, in the Boulevard Périphérique uh, in Paris or in the Place de la Concorde. For instance, we need technology to solve this, uh, this issue and not only technology to improve at uh, uh, vehicle level. Mm -hmm. um, and, and yeah, and I think we need also, uh, there's still a lot of things to, 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 to be done in, uh, in electric uh, mobility and in zero emission uh, mobility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in car. I think that one of the important things that happened in transport research, say for the last 20 years or so, was that we started to understand more and more how closely interlinked mobility and urban life is. Mm. And I think that one of the important things now in the automotive discussion is that we don't lose that aspect again. I think, that, I think that's probably expanding a bit on what, what Claire was saying, but that, I mean, what, there is a risk now that we're ending up saying, well, Autonomous vehicles is obviously the answer. Sorry, what was the question? So um, <laughs> right. I, yeah. I think that we have to start looking into how, what autonomous vehicles can do to how we live our lives, in particular in cities uh, and on the planet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, again, I'm uh, even as somebody who's spent a lot of time watching this industry, I'm really surprised at how we just all now assume that autonomous vehicles are going to be here fairly quickly and they're going to really change everything. And um, I wonder, do you think we're getting ahead of ourselves there? I mean, is there any chance that this will turn out to be like, I don't know, a lot of technologies sort of fizzle and it, this is probably pretty close to the top of the hype right now? Um, what do you think? What would it look like if we don't have autonomous vehicles? If there's sort of like, you know, the Hindenburg disaster of <laughs> autonomous vehicles and it was like, uh, that was a bad, bad idea. What would that future look like? It, it could be like just like with VR, where we had like a, yeah. a bit of a hype. Um, yeah, I don't know in which uh, time span, but like a, yeah. a decade ago maybe. Yeah. Uh, and now it's actually becoming mature. So it could go that way. It could be the same with autonomous vehicles, to mm -hmm. be realistic. Yeah. OK. Yeah. But it could still, you're not saying that it, you're saying it would happen later. Yeah, it's it, still going to happen. Yeah, I, I yeah. still believe it's going to happen. but. Um, the most difficult part is, of course, always changing the habits of people. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, if you still see your car as a status symbol, if you still uh, uh, have all kinds of other indicators on how you choose how you travel around in these things, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it might be difficult to change that generation. And maybe you need a new generation that uh, really doesn't care about purchasing a vehicle uh, and, and just goes, uh, um, goes for mobility in a different way. Yeah. It's, uh, it's like uh, in the Netherlands, uh, young people, they don't want to buy houses anymore. They don't want to buy cars. And they're shifting towards um, yeah, this, this shared mindset instead of this individual mindset. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To me, the current development seem very technology driven. Uh, but I know very little about what's happening behind the scenes in the industry. But if it's as technology driven as it seems to me, then I think that the risk is that the, the things about costs and price levels and demand has not been properly th thought through because the, the, in the end, someone has to be able to pay the price. Uh, if they, those cars, it's not sufficient that they are attractive, they should also be affordable. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how much we know about those things yet. Yeah, any thoughts about who's going to own these fleets? You know, people have talked about the car makers themselves have been getting into car sharing. We've got you know, Uber and places like that. People have talked about utility companies essentially offering transportation as another utility. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's really difficult to know today um, because I mean, every company wants to, to, to go from whatever they are doing today to mobility provider. Uh, and some are going to win, some are going to lose, mm -hmm. but it's still really difficult to say if it's going to be Uber or uh, a car maker or uh, maybe a, a utility company or even an insurer. I don't yeah. know. It's, it's 
still uh, under question, mm -hmm. and we'll see in the, in the coming years who is, who is going to win. Okay, so it's an open field. Anybody, any of you can be the fleet owner for the, the next yeah. thing. Yeah, no, I think also the nice fact is that uh, there are many, many specific industries and areas where you can actually start deploying and testing, like uh, a harbor, for example, a closed area, you need to move containers, and uh, doing that automatically is a very nice step to test the technology before, mm -hmm. before starting to transport people, for example. So there are these very nice trajectories, step-by-step, uh, kind of uh, driving aids, for example, that are coming. And that's most likely where the business is going to be f still for the next few years mm -hmm. before self-driving cars come in. And, and that will also be a time to lower the cost, hopefully, of, of the final technology that will be required. Mm. OK. Yeah. No? All right. <laughs> so we've got a little bit more than 10 minutes left. And I wanted to, I should have, I'm sorry, but I have to ask the organizers, are we taking audience questions? Somebody who works here can tell us? OK. If, if we are, then uh, just you know, wave at us and we'll start doing that. Um, so, but in the meantime, going back to, uh, to this question of like who, who owns and, and um, manages these fleets is probably the key question. I feel like a lot of us, we assume the technology is there, we assume the demand is there, and it seems like most people, you know, that, that's not a, a big con uh, point of contention. But how does this get started? Like who, you know, who moves first? Because there's a, bit, you know, a lot of chicken and egg questions here about, well, we need the rules to let the cars on the road. We need the drivers in the cars to have a business model. There's a lot of things that depend on each other. So how do you see this? Uh, who's the first mover here? Well, I think that taxi companies or Uber com type companies, I think that perhaps the advantage is primarily on them because, because driver cost is such a large, large part of their business cost. Mm. So I think that perhaps moving a, a taxi fleet to autonomous, it, it, that will um, pay back mm -hmm. rather fast compared to, to uh, for a private person, mm -hmm. for example. And so I think that perhaps that will be the development that ta taxi companies move to autonomous and by that provide a, uh, um, a service that is mm. so efficient that it takes over. Mm. That's my guess. Yeah, I think we can do some parallels with, the, with what is, uh, is currently happening for bikes and, uh, mm -hmm. and scooters. Uh, you have new companies uh, coming from China or from Europe that uh, own and operate fleets of bikes, uh, free floating black bikes and, and scooters. So maybe that's the model for, for cars in the, in, in the coming years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there will be software to update, there will be hardware to update. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you think, think from that perspective, owning a car on a personal level is, is going to be pretty tricky because you will have to pay for hefty service fees maybe every three years to get mm -hmm. it upgraded so that it will work in the existing system. So my feeling is that the manufacturers will actually own the vehicles. Mm -hmm. But okay. the interesting part is we're seeing many of the fleet operators planning to produce their own vehicles. And most mm. likely because of this reason, because they would have then the best access actually to have the latest technology and decide when to upgrade. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> Nothing yeah. You, you guys are going to own and operate or roll them out? You will own and operate and roll them out? And no, the community will. The community yeah. will in the end. Uh, I think, um, uh, yeah, like what you said, I think it's, it's good for people to get used to uh, this collective fleet uh, based on maybe uh, bikes or all kinds of other vehicles. Mm -hmm. And this will start creating this mindset shift uh, towards also accepting this for cars, I, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so to, uh, sorry, did you? I was just thinking that there is this issue about regulation, the dull issue of mm -hmm. regulation. And when you said the, the free floating bikes in China, I know that there is an issue there, that when it becomes efficient, uh, not to collect the bikes when they have been left or scrapped somewhere because, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, because you don't have this private ownership of the bikes, so you have a different cost model or co cost pri profile again. So I think that there will arise community issues, like societal issues, that ha from any business model that mm -hmm. we would have to, to cope with. Hmm. Well, to, to kind of you know, bring this back to the, the types of big questions, I think this is a great forum for us as we start to wrap up. Um, there's probably nothing that has changed cities in the last thousand years as much as automobiles did, right? So, and that was an unexpected change. Nobody planned how it was going to happen or even, I think, 
you know, even the people that foresaw some of the good and bad changes really were powerless to do anything about them. So if we think about the impact, not of urban mobility, but on mobility on the urban environment, what do you see the next, I'm going to say, 100 years? What is, what's going to happen? How are cities going to change because of these new means of transportation, new forms of ownership, you know, again, the flow changing? What do you see uh, uh, the 100 years from now, hello tomorrow, looking like when we sit here and have this discussion? Because we also have longevity coming, so we're going to be, it's going to be <laughs> us. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I once saw this visual, uh, I don't know who created it, but it was about this layered uh, system of uh, mobility for a city. And that you had, like, uh, of course, the, the tunnels of Elon Musk uh, really deep under the ground and the metro tunnels. And um, had this layer of ground transportation that was minimized uh, uh, just to uh, like short distances, not wasting any space for humans to walk around, so to say. Mm -hmm. And then this, uh, this drone layer. And I think it's going to get so common that everything around us will be... Uh, uh, crowded with uh, with many devices carrying uh, mm -hmm. yeah smaller things or uh, or uh, yeah one person vehicles or these kind of things. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what automobiles did to cities was that they started to sprawl. To sprawl. Oh, sprawl. Sprawl. Right. Yeah. That mm -hmm. they started to sprawl, and I think that that's uh, there's so many disadvantages of that. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's, again, one of the important things that we have to consider to think, look at the ways that um, increased mobility might affect... Because actually, we're not in cities to move. We're in cities to engage with each other and take the benefits of that. And sprawling cities have many, very many disadvantages. Mm. I think to, to get some advantages at scale of those new technologies and new uses, maybe we need to, to wait for the late 2020s or something like that. And then you have the impact on urbanism and the way our cities are, are structured. And that costs a lot to, to build a road, to uh, build a new uh, um, transport infrastructure, or to change where people live and uh, where people work. And that may take some more time than, uh, than what we, we are currently thinking about. Yeah. Uh, I also I, I saw this concept of this uh, skyscraper that looked like a vending machine where uh, apartments mm -hmm. would just be shipped in like, uh, like shipping containers. Uh, I could also imagine if um, mobility becomes so wasteful um, that uh, yeah, you're also going to live smaller, you don't need all that stuff because you can access things more easily. Mm -hmm. So maybe your house will also become literally mobile and mm -hmm. uh, you just flow around uh, to your activity from that week uh, with your... Uh, with your home. Mm -hmm. it, uh, it could get pretty crazy in that sense. Yeah. Okay. We all live and work and yeah. get around in containers and just go <laughs> multimodal. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, well, um, th that, uh, again, that's another tra uh, technology that really transforms cities and ports because the, you know, the uh, ability to get large amounts of goods all over the planet really quickly, again, has had, I think, mostly hugely beneficial consequences, but uh, it's also change the structure of manufacturing and society has really gone away from what you were talking about, Vince, with the local manufacturing has become hyper-centralized. And um, the, uh, the, the carry-on effects of that, again, if you think about the carry-on effects of, of mobility beyond just the cities, you know, how does it change the, not just urban mobility, but international or you know, intercontinental mobility? Are we going to need airplanes if we can just jump in a car and you know, ride a few hours in its utilized time? Yeah, I don't believe in a one solution fits all, so I think it will also be a, yeah, like a, there will also be place always for all kinds of solutions. Um, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Any other long distance changes? Is it this still going to be local, you know, local fleets just sort of circling around urban areas? I, I think if we end up in a situation where it's easier to go from the center of Paris to the center of London with an hyperloop than from the center of Paris to, uh, I don't know, Saint-Saint-Denis or uh, the suburb of Paris, it's going to be a big issue mm -hmm. for uh, equality and for our societies, our cities. So that's something that can happen in, 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 the, coming, in the coming years because we, we have seen a lot of new things to speed up uh, the, the, the speed of, of, of our travel in interior band, uh, like with Hyperloop or with the TGV in, in France. Mm -hmm. But if we do not improve uh, congestions and, uh, and the speed f 
from urban to suburban, then we are going to have a, a, a problem. Mm -hmm. So, oh, sorry, Karen. Yeah, no, I'm just thinking again about this idealized image of where we're going to be. And I, we must remember that there's also totally different ideals of cities, uh, which we may be moving away from, and where we might end up having a big conflict about how really what we want cities to be. Uh, and I think that perhaps autonomous vehicles will not survive unless they can take that challenge and show how they can support creating cities that are more, the, say, the Richard Florida type, where we have a lot of social interaction, where we live very close to each other, where, we, um, where, where the meeting between people is the important thing. I think that, that's an essential part uh, of where we have to move cities to be to be able to meet many other challenges. Mm -hmm. no. Sorry, no. So uh, again, we're just about out of time. So as we start to, again, wrap up this conversation and, and move back towards uh, mingling with everybody else, um, what are questions that you would ask? You know, what are things that either uh, of other people on the panel or of people in the audience, like what are the biggest, say, three biggest questions that each of you have that you want to get answered uh, here at uh, Hello Tomorrow? And Vince, I'm going to start with you. So it's um, yeah, for me, it's just about uh, proving that the community effort can maybe be uh, better than um, yeah, a centralized company approach mm -hmm. uh, to something. Uh, I think the, se the second thing is, um, um, for us, it's, it's trust in uh, this blockchain approach, uh, like really financing it, it yourself instead of the being dependent upon traditional means. Um, yeah, and maybe the third thing is, uh, uh, yeah, this, this feeling of going back to local with everything. I think we, we have this hyper-global mindset right now, and um, maybe the power in the future uh, lies again with local, with small, and uh, see if, if this shift is something realistic or if this, uh, mm -hmm. if this is just a dream. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Nico, what do you think? Well, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> for me, the big question is, is obviously the, the time when this will actually happen. Mm -hmm. so, so how fast will it happen? And uh, also from a technical perspective, uh, especially if we talk about autonomous driving, how to ensure that it's going to be much safer than human driving and then how fast the transition will take place. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, for me, the big question is how to make sure that we really connect technology with people and cities to make sure that we build something not for answering a question we don't know, but to answer the, the question everyone is, uh, is facing, and for the cities is congestion, is uh, climate change, for the people is how to improve the way I move in, in the city to, uh, with uh, faster uh, travel and an uh, and easier way to, 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 to move. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I guess my answer would be very, rather similar. I would very much like to see how autom the, the development we're looking at here, uh, how that can support and be interlinked with uh, climate change issues, uh, defossilization of transport, all those other issues that are actually, I think, for the planet, even more burning than the issue of whether we have to hold the steering wheel when we drive. So I have to answer my own question of questions here. Um, the thing that I uh, am most curious about and what I really hope to, to engage with everybody here and, and you guys also afterwards about is what are the unanswered questions? So the things that we would have never predicted, like with nobody saw, for example, uh, with social media, the fact that we basically have friendships all over the world and the way that you know, we, uh, really the fabric of society has, has the topology of our friendship has changed. Nobody would have seen that coming when we talked about the PC revolution, which was basically a better way to write letters, right? Or again, with, with smartphones and things like that, I don't know why we call them phones. The last thing you do is actually call somebody. It's very rude. You text and say, is it okay if we, we have to talk? Um, and so with, again, all these forces coming together around urban mobility, I, I don't think we've even really begun to scratch the surface of it. So um, I'll, uh, I'll just wrap up with that and, uh, and say that the, the conversation is really just beginning as our panel ends. Uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, those of you who attended. And uh, thanks for Hello Tomorrow for having us on the panel. So please uh, join me in.